Hello, and welcome to the Inside AVs podcast for November the 20th, 2020. This is episode number 33. Today, we'll be talking about driving the Candy 27, driving the ID4, General Motors is speeding up its electric strategy, and internal combustion engines are banned in the UK in 2030. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, longtime EV owner and Inside EVs editor. And we also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the superb videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And joining us as a special guest for just a little bit today is Clint Simone. He is a video specialist and editor for Mortar One, our sister publication. Uh, so uh, welcome, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the audience and gentlemen of the panel. We have a very interesting lineup of vehicles for our What's Charging in Our Driveways segment this week. So uh, let's start with Clint, who is here specifically to tell us about his driving impressions of the Audi Q5 55TFSIE. I think that's it. If you're <laughs> yeah, unfamiliar, right. with, if you're unfamiliar with that vehicle, it's a plug-in SUV hybrid um, with a turbocharged two-liter engine that, in conjunction with the electric motor, is good for about 362 horsepower, 369 pound-feet of torque. It's got a 14. 0.1 kilowatt hour battery and is eligible yep. for uh, six thousand seven hundred and twelve dollars of the seventy five hundred dollar federal tax credit and is said to give you an epa rated range of 19 miles and i think it i think it's space price is around 51.9 uh, but you can tell me clint maybe they did a lot of the hard work for me there uh thank oh, you everybody for having me on real quick i appreciate that i've come here to quickly advocate for this car and then to pick your, your brains real quick because I'm a bit confused by it and then plugins in general in that segment. And I think you are all the people to tell me about it. But just real quick, we did have that Audi Q5 plug-in in the Motor One long-term fleet for a couple of months. There she is right there. Um, and I come here to talk about it because we drive this thing for a few months. I'm in and out of it every day living like somebody would if they, if they bought one themselves. And I was really impressed by it. And I think this is a type of vehicle, this, the BMW X3, uh, the Volvo that it competes with. It's just sort of a strange class of vehicle. And everybody looks and says, well, the range isn't that good with the plug-in. Um, I've come here to report that in the real world, we actually did about 22, 23 all electric miles. It kind of beat Audi's uh, projection. And then the combined MPG figure, we did a little better as well. We did just under uh, 30 combined MPG when you look at living with that car every day. Um, we also went over Audi's full range rating with a full tank of gas uh, and electric power. We did 417 miles. So I like this thing a lot more than I thought. And I want to know what you guys think about these types of vehicles and if they really do have a place if customer demand for them is strong enough. Kyle, you're pretty familiar with Audi so, products. Did you want to? Yeah, I've uh, sampled just about every new Audi product in the market. And and Clint, I share a lot of the same initial confusion about plug-in hybrids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You had brought up different versions, for example. So like I had the, the V60 plug-in hybrid from Volvo. I have the XC90 this week coming up. I have uh, the RAV4 Prime. All of these plug-in hybrids. And I always come back to two things and I'm very split. It is either the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds. And I'm, it's never in the middle for me. I'm never just, okay, it's a plug-in. It's always like, well, you're getting a terrible internal combustion and a terrible plug-in system, or you're getting, you know, a great battery, you know, drive it around town all you want. Uh, and, and of course you have the, the range of the gas engine. So it's a very much a split uh, mm -hmm. choice for me. I still haven't made up my mind on these. Now, I have not sampled the Q5 e-tron yet, so I'm really curious as to how much time you were really able to drive it electric. Was it annoying that you had to come back to it and plug it in after every time to optimize the electric range? Because, you know, the benefit of a battery electric vehicle right. is I only have to plug it in once a week if I really want to. It's not like I'm mm -hmm. trying to constantly charge it. So what was that like while you were living with it? So 
I live in the middle of downtown Miami, close to uh, the Motorsport Network headquarters where Motor One and some of Inside EVs is based out of. So it's definitely an urban environment, not a ton of highway driving. And the plugging in is uh, across the street at a Whole Foods for me. So it's about as urban as you can get with it. But you're right. Uh, you do have to plug it in very often to get a lot of the range benefit with it. And there were plenty of times where that thing had a dead battery and you just kind of live with it as a normal Q5. And to me to do, you know, I think it was low to mid twenties, uh, miles per gallon when that battery is dead, not great. But I mean, if you look at a normal Q5, you're obviously doing a little better. Dom said this at the beginning, but it has 362 horsepower, which is actually more than the SQ5. Um, right. It, yeah, so it, it does move and it's big and it's heavy. This car's main problem is itself because we had a 2020 model year, which you could probably get a much better deal on now because the 21 model just came out, the facelift. So it has, you know, some newer interior components, but it's the same powertrain um, and just some light styling updates overall. So I'd like to jump in really quickly, and hopefully there's not too much background noise. There's construction going on right outside my door. Um, but uh, so I had the uh, BMW X3 uh, xDrive 30e as a press loaner for a week, and uh, probably even a little bit longer than a week because it was during when the COVID-19 first hit, and BMW was just kind of like here take it as much as you want because nobody's bar taking these cars right now. So I, I drove it for quite some time and I was really impressed with it also. Now, of course, I always want as an, uh, as really a, a electric vehicle enthusiast, I always want more range. It's never enough. When you see that it was EPA range rated at 20 miles, you, getting into it, you feel like, oh, I'm going to be disappointed by the range here. But you know what I, one of the things that you have to realize, depending on your driving cycle, uh, a lot of people that use these don't drive long on their daily commutes or daily routes, or maybe it's, you know, the, the person that lives at home is just running local errands. And if you plug it in after you, after you um, go and run your 15, 20 mile errand, and, and then it's recharged for the next time you head out, you can easily get average like 60, 70, 80, 100 miles per gallon with these vehicles, depending on what your driving cycle is. And, and, you know, I did that on a couple different occasions where there were a couple days where I didn't have any long drives and I would run 25, 30 mile errands, come back, plug it in. A few hours later, I'd run out for a 10 mile errand, come back. And, and, and I, I had two or three days in, in my whole time with the vehicle where I used like, you know, half a gallon of gas in three or four days. And I drove 75, 80 miles. Yeah. So, you know, it, it really depends on what your use case is to really under, to really realize how efficient it's going to be. But even on the long trips, I, I took it on a 200 mile, I think, round trip. I think I averaged like 30 something miles per gallon, you know, for, for a decent size SUV. That's that's really good. And uh, it's one of the most powerful uh, SUVs, uh, X3s. I think only like the M40 uh, X3 is, has more power than it. So it was responsive. It was powerful. All It was an all around better X3 than the other X3s I've, I've driven. And with the federal tax credit, it actually costs a little less. Now, I don't, I'm not sure how the Audi pricing goes, but, you know, for me, it was a big win. It, you know, it was, it cost less. It was better response, more, better performance and better fuel mileage. So I look at these type of vehicles as somebody's going into an Audi dealership. They're not looking to buy an electric vehicle. They just happen to mm -hmm. get this because the salesperson understands how it works talks to them about the different uh, uh, incentives they can get where it's 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 not going to cost that much because they get local and federal tax incentives and the performance is better and hey you're going to get better gas mileage they sell to the people that way and then all of a sudden this customer after th a three-year lease on this as now electric is normal for them they're used to plugging a car in that they, they, they like the they liked it you know they generally most people that got plug-in hybrids like them and now their next vehicle is going to be an electric vehicle so it's definitely like a transitional type of a vehicle i think that gets people exposed to electric vehicles that normally wouldn't have i don't think there's going to be too many people that uh, say, oh, I want an electric car, and then they, they're like, yeah, this is the electric car I want, or the, the, the X3. I think more is going to be people that weren't planning on getting an electric car. So for that, for that market, I think it's good that we're introducing these people to plugins. 
So when you had the car, Clint, uh, did you find yourself like trying to fill it up with electricity, like when it was low, or did it matter to you that much? Was it yeah, I played this game where there was a, this e-tron in my neighborhood that always tried to hog the Whole Foods charger. So I would look out of my window, which looks at the Whole Foods. This is very particular, I know. And I would see when they weren't there. And I would run and I would go take the car over and plug it in. And then I would stand there like this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I tried to fill it up as often as possible. Obviously, this would still work best for somebody that has a home and can plug it in at their home. But it yeah. is doable in urban environments. I guess the, the big question I was left with, and this is something all of you can answer better than me, is a car like this, if it had 50 or 60 miles of EV range, maybe something more like uh, RAV4 Prime territory, I think it'd be perfect. And to me, it seems like, especially the, the German luxury OEMs are across the board are just focusing now on full EV SUVs, which is, of course, very important. But it seems to me like they're kind of skipping over this segment. And as Tom pointed out, this could be a segment of cars that is the perfect intermediary for a lot of customers. And I'm wondering if that's a mistake. I'm not hearing of people developing a Q5 that will get 60 miles of EV range or an X3, etc. Well, we've seen BMW announce all of their plug-in hybrids will have at least 100 km, 100 kilometers of range. I don't know if that's WLTP or EPA yeah. cycle. Um, so we've seen them take the shift. But you know what? I think, uh, and Tom will totally disagree with me here, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing this. I think we're past plug-in hybrids. I think you get a uh. really good internal combustion vehicle without the compromise of hauling around a battery pack, like you had mentioned, without the... Uh, lessened fuel economy when the battery depletes if you live in an urban environment without yeah. home charging a plug-in hybrid's really annoying uh because like you said you have to look at the whole food see if the e-tron's gone uh you know for me we're i'm very lucky i, I just plug it in my garage i don't think about it so it works better in my case right uh, but again the the whole plug-in hybrid thing i think the the biggest break away for me is if the plug-in hybrid cannot be driven up to highway speeds and have good acceleration in ev mode uh then it's 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 gone for me like the volvo plug-in hybrids you can barely accelerate up to speed in them without kicking on the internal combustion engine and then it's gone so when the uh, audi has juice in it it'll do it it did like 80 or so cool and did, with, was there a easy way was there like a detent in the pedal that you could know you could floor in ev mode without kicking on the internal combustion engine yeah, there, it was actually pretty high up. I was impressed. To me, it felt like uh, Audi engineers will be mad if I get this wrong. But when you gunned it, it seemed like the gas engine came on no matter what. But right. normal throttle application, uh, normal to moderate is, is fine. It would stay off the entire time. Yeah, a lot of manufacturers will use the kick down switch when locked mm -hmm. in EV mode to, to kick on the, the gas engine. And then you have a stone cold turbocharged gas engine turning on at full boost. For long term right. ownership, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Uh, but no, so so uh, to your point, Tom, I, I'm curious to hear what you think, but I, I think there's not a big case for these 60, 70 mile plug in hybrids. I know many will disagree with me. I think you just go full electric at that point and get four or 500 miles of range, which we'll be seeing in just a couple of years. And, uh, well, so I, I agree with what Kyle is saying from his perspective. And don't forget, we have very tainted perspectives here. We've been driving EVs for years. We, we understand them. We know them. We love them. But you take a look at the, you know, the middle America family that, you know, to them, it's such a foreign idea. Um, just knowing that there's a gasoline engine in the car that they can fall back on is 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 very important for them to 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 getting that first plug-in. So I think if we were to say, okay, there's we're past plug-in hybrids, we're not going to make them anymore. I think that would actually really slow down um, of the the full battery electric adoption because we, we'd get this large segment of the population that would just avoid plug-ins like the plague and say, no, that's not for me. But mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that these plug-in hybrids, um, even the mild ones with lower range will, will, will offer that uh, ability for these people that normally would not get into plug-in. And I, I, I speak to a lot of people. I, 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 talk, I do a lot of dealership training. I talk to the people in the dealerships and they, I get feedback from them that, you know, that, that, that many of their customers would not even consider 
a fully electric car. They're years away from that. And this gets, this normalizes the plug for them. So I think in that regards that I think it's important. And I think we're going to think these are going to be around for a while. I think at least through the end of this decade, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to have a good amount of plug-in hybrids. And, and, and to Clint's um, question about, you know, why don't we see more cars with 50, 60, 70 miles of, 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 uh, of EV range and also be a plug-in hybrid. And, uh, you know, I think it's all comes down to cost, Clint, where, you know, the, it, the battery is very expensive component in the vehicle and packaging. And, and the bigger the battery is, the more expensive it costs and um, they have to figure out ways of fitting it. So, you know, yeah, sure, if they could put a 60 or 70 mile battery in, in, a, in an existing mm -hmm. platform with a nice platform, fit it, package it in there, fit it, and keep the price relatively, don't forget the price has to be close to the gas counterpart. If if you've got to reach into your pocket $10,000 more for the plug-in hybrid version, I don't care how many miles it goes, people aren't gonna buy it. The, the price has to be very close and or even less when you factor in the incentives in order to get people interested in them. Because you know that we're, we're still at that you know point where that we have such a huge percentage of the of the population that doesn't know anything about electric vehicles, and it's such a big you know decision to buy or lease a car. It's uh, next to home purchase. It's it's typically the largest person somebody uh, uh, purchase somebody will make. They're not going to just take a, a flyer on this new technology that they that they're unsure about. So I think the plug-in hybrid gives them that sense of security. It's the training wheels that they're not going to fall off the bike. So I think I think they're going to be around for a while, but I totally understand where Kyle comes from, even with his perspective on well, if, the, if you can't go up to if you can't mash the accelerator and go up to eighty miles an hour with a plug-in hybrid, then don't make it. And uh, driving these cars and knowing these cars, I, I totally agree with him. But I don't think the public gives a damn about whether it's in gas mode or all electric mode. When when they mash that accelerator, they're trying to get onto the highway. They don't want that truck bearing down on them, you know, to, to rear end them. They don't care what's power in the car at that point. But from an enthusiast point of view, I totally get where Kyle's coming from. Right on. All right. Well, thanks for that, Clint. Uh, do you have any, any other questions you wanted to uh, say before you head out? No, I appreciate you guys having me, and I, I love coming here and stirring the pot. I'm going to go over to Whole Foods now and uh, see if the spot is available and pick up some cookies. Awesome. Well, I, yeah, just just stand there like this. <laughs> that, that's wait what for I the do. E guy it's like the equivalent <laughs> of icing, to be honest with you. I'm a bully, but I have a plug in myself. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Yeah, we should have another conversation about should you even public charge a plug in hybrid? No, right. there's a lot of controversy. Probably not, but All I right. told them that I work for Motor One and Inside EVs and I had to do it. And don't yell at me. No, that's cool. No, <laughs> I, I actually, I'm, I'm under the theory that you should public charge it. Anyway, we'll see you guys. Have okay. a good one. Bye, Clint. Take care, Clint. Okay. See you, Clint. All right. So, um, as I said, this that's not the only car we drove this week. Kyle had the opportunity to drive the highly anticipated Volkswagen ID4 just a few days ago. Uh, he recorded a video for his out of spec motoring uh, YouTube channel, but it's uh, just him talking about his driving impressions. Volkswagen had as an embargo on showing footage of the drive, so we we haven't shown you uh, any of that footage yet. Uh, so we'll bring up. Uh, some some uh, video that we have that we are allowed to show, and that's was of uh, Tanner Faust honing uh, the electric crossover on a track. To, um, right, and so let's look at that while Kyle kind of tells us what he thinks of this new Volkswagen. Yeah, sure. So you know, I had the uh, great opportunity to drive ID four. Um, one of the things was, uh, you know, people are asking, "Where's the video? Where's the video?" Well, we are technically like it's the weirdest embargo I've ever seen from a manufacturer. Right. So they say, go ahead, tell your viewers everything you want about this car. Like no embargo on impressions, tell them everything. Great. You've already shown what the car looks like, but oh, by the way, you can't share your footage of anything you took yet. And we're not sure when we're going to let you post all that stuff. So right. I'm sitting here with the videos just done. Uh, some will go on out of spec reviews, like the original one, which is a brand new channel where we review all cars, not just EVs, but as Tom knows, to continue the press car rotations. And I still like uh, internal combustion and plug-in hybrids. 
out of spec reviews is is the channel for for just everything to go on we're doing a video a day there which is just a lot of work but uh, we're working on it so id4 uh what really matters here is uh you know i i went to detroit flew there with time in uh, just for this, we literally uh, took two days, flew to Detroit and back for a one hour experience with ID4. And uh, it's awesome. I mean, there's no other way of saying it than <laughs> this thing rocks. Uh, first of all, the styling, it's so pleasant. It's so happy. Look at that car. How could you be angry seeing this thing coming down the road? It's not uh, happy in like a weird way, like the candy is just quirky. This is a premium upscale feeling and looking vehicle. Uh, and the price is just insane. So um, I think what we, we come down to here is you have an EV that on paper isn't that impressive because the range is 250 miles, which I believe to be totally fine EPA. You have acceleration yeah. that doesn't blow anyone away. You have 125 kilowatt charging. It all ticks the right boxes, but it's not in the, let me just blow your mind category. Uh, you know, it doesn't have any ludicrous mode stuff. And I think that's where you're going to lose out on a lot of the Tesla owners and lucid fans that like the uh, on paper stats wars. But this car in actuality, in reality, is under $40,000 before tax credits here in the US, which is insane. Uh, uh, the one I drove was 45, it was the first edition, I think it's 45, 46. And um, it, it, it feels like a 50, $60,000 car in there. Uh, the material choices around are, are extremely pleasant everywhere you touch. There are hard plastics everywhere you don't touch. But Volkswagen's right. done a really nice job, similar to i3, of making those hard plastics feel nice, uh, and it still feels very premium. The biggest takeaways for me were ride quality. It has that waftiness of an e-tron or a Rolls Royce going over the bumps. Uh, it, it, it really soaks up the bumps way better than I expected, and it's extremely quiet inside. It's not quite uh, e e-tron quiet. That's probably the quietest car I've actually ever driven. Uh, but you can still hear a pin drop in this car at highway speeds. You know, I took it up to its max speed and, and felt uh, how it drives and it's very good. I really love the rear wheel drive nature of it. It is not fast in a straight line, but it is properly powered. You'll never need more power than this car has for getting around. So in my book for the price, uh, a time and I were, were talking while we were driving around, you'll see it in the videos when I can post them. We're like, what can we find that we don't like about this car? Because we can't just come out and say we love everything. And there's only two things that I don't love about the car. And the first is there's no auto hold when you come to a stop. So you have to keep your foot on the brake pedal. Uh, the i3 is the same way, but it's kind of annoying. It should have auto hold. And the second is uh, in key up when you turn the car on and put it in drive, it doesn't turn regen on automatically. You have to click the notch one more time forwards to go into braking mode. So you have D and B, it's like the Chevy Bolt. Um, so is that a big deal? I don't know. Can it be fixed through software? Absolutely. Uh, that was literally it. Everything else I was blown away with, loved it, loved the UI, loved wireless car play, loved the space in the back. The back seats were insanely comfortable. Uh, the room in the trunk was great. Now, Tom's also driven it, so I'm excited to hear his thoughts because yeah. we haven't talked about ID4 yet. Uh, but I was very lucky that the person after me in the rotation, the media rotation, actually canceled. So I got to spend an extra bit of time with the car, and we brought it back with one minute to spare. Hey, do you know if it comes in all-wheel drive as well? <laughs> Yes, all-wheel drive will come, not at launch. Okay, awesome. But and it'll have more power than two, right? Uh, the ID four will have three hundred and four, yes. three hundred and something horsepower with all-wheel drive. That's mm -hmm. going to be the one yeah, if we get one that I would like. Yeah. First off, yeah, living yeah. in Colorado with the yeah. snow, we'd want all-wheel drive. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, look it, from my perspective, as much as I was very impressed with the build quality of Nissan Aria. I don't see how anyone could consider that car over this. And you know, we're a month away now from US buyers getting these in their driveways. We're recording this on the 20th of November. Uh, the the story this week or whenever it was on Inside EVs was any time around the 17th to the 24th, that delivery week of the ID4s getting into the hands of consumers. And a really good point that I want people to to make sure that they they pick up on and don't um, you know, don't miss that Kyle made there is this car is a VW. And while VW make quick cars, they have their R lines and things like that, 
it does everything that it should do. And if you're a new car brand and you're Tesla or Lucid or Rivian, you have to create heat and attention. Well, VW don't have to do that. They don't have to make the biggest, best, fastest, longest EV in the world. Because if they want to make a fast EV, they'll point you towards a thing called Porsche and Lamborghini. And if they want to make a truck, they'll point you towards a Scania. And if they want to make a bike, they'll point you towards, you know, Bugatti or, uh, not Bugatti, um, uh, their bike Ducati. brand. Uh, Ducati. And a luxury one, Bugatti. And, and, oh, and by the way, this is the VW brand, and it does what it does really, really well. Now, saying that, uh, I've owned a bunch of VWs at the time, and I had a, a Golf at the time of Dieselgate. And so I was caught up in that, and I still have a bit of taste in my mouth, and they've got some making up to do. So... Um, they're not. They're still not in my good books, but I don't want people to miss that because the, the stats wars get overblown on the internet and in EV circles, and I want people to get out of that bubble and and think about who's going to buy the ID for, and and I just think this could this could blow up. I just think it, it, it has the potential if they put enough of them in the US, and of course they're all coming from Europe for now. Frustratingly, I think it could be it could be mega. It's the Beetle of the 21st century. I say if as long as they have the right marketing and we have the right communication, there is going to be no one who buys this car and is disappointed with it. I mean, I very, very rarely am this impressed with the vehicle, aside from the Candy K27. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, the, this is this is insane. So, 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 OK, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. So it's funny. It. Um, I, I want everybody to jump over to the post that I wrote, my first drive impressions of the ID4, because virtually everything Martin and Kyle just said, I wrote about last month when I drove it. It's like they, 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 they we we're, we're all of the same mind on this vehicle as far as its driving ability and also the strengths of it and the fact that Volkswagen's going after a certain segment and they're going to go after it very well. The, the Volkswagen representatives literally told me that this is their Beetle of the 21st century and that they're not going after Tesla Model Y uh, uh, consume customers. They're going after RAV4 and Honda CRV customers with this vehicle. And it beats the heck out of those vehicles, in my opinion, in nearly every category. They want this to be the car that they want to sell millions of these per, yes. per year, not not thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Once they're up on uh, all five, because five factories are going to be making this car it, it, within, I think, two and a half years. Once they're up to full production, they want to sell millions of these per year. And I was probably nearly as impressed as Kyle was, as, as you can see in my review, one of the few things that I criticized it for was what Kyle did was the braking being like, I guess, EV snobs, you can call Kyle and I, you know, reject. I don't know if it's that important to somebody who's never driven an EV before, but to, to people that are experienced EV drivers, I didn't like the fact that it has artificial creep and you can't turn it off and that you really can't do one pedal driving because the car will, will you know, it just, the regen isn't aggressive enough and it'll never stop. It'll just keep rolling once it hits a certain um, speed and then the artificial creep takes over and it just keeps rolling. But I talked to the Volkswagen reps about that and they said, hey, look, if that's something that people are com com uh, complaining about, if our customers um, aren't happy with that, it's just software. We could change that. We could do it, uh, you know, an, a, an update. And, and give you your, uh, you know, the ability to turn off artificial creep and true one pedal driving. So let's see. But they're really aiming this for first time EV buyers that just want a car to haul around the family, efficient, low cost, low running costs. Um, that is going to take customers, like I said, from these main competitors that kind of own this space. The the, the Honda CRV and the and the, and the Toyota Rav4 like own this 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 segment of the market pretty much i know there's other competitors that sell a lot but those those two are you know one and two and uh the the, the id4 has the opportunity to be the first uh, electric vehicle to really penetrate that market and really take huge swaths of customers from these two really established models so dom what do you think because dom you spend your time in the inside of these forums and you know you 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 know you spend a lot of time listening to conversations. How do you think the EV community reacts to this kind of car versus those who wouldn't go to an, an, an inside EV forum yet? And, I, and I'm aware that that is increasing because people are wanting to learn about it and, 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 and 
do research. So how do you think this car lands with the sort of the population? Well, this one hasn't, uh, we don't have a, a, like an owner or a lot of enthusiasts talking about the VW ID4 on Inside EV's forum at the moment. Uh, if you're enthusiastic about it, please come and, you know, start some threads and uh, gin up some excitement because, it, you know, it's a great car. It looks like a great opportunity. Um, I think it's it's almost like a, it's not like a stealth program because, it's you know, it's very understated itself and it doesn't have like spectacular numbers. Like So I think the, the EV crowd are kind of – and. And like you, they still have some of the stink of Dieselgate, you know, in their in their mind, and you know, they're not super enthusiastic about Volkswagen. But you know, it's it's as you, it seems like it's a pretty decent car, you know, understated, but you know, very competent inside. And for the price, like this price, Kyle, um, you said under forty thousand dollars, then the seventy five hundred dollar. So people can get in this for what thirty four thousand dollars. Yeah, and then in certain states, you're in the 20s, like uh, New Jersey, and you get three years of free charging at Electrify America, unlimited to 100%. Like, there is nothing that comes close and, to And this. your fuel costs have just been like a quarter, by a quarter of what you were paying for the probably the gas version of whatever it was you were driving in Atlas, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, Dom, also, like, like Kyle mentioned, though, with the – with the uh, Electrify America three-year unlimited charging, your your costs would be less than a quarter. You know, if if you really wanted to lease this thing and just use Electrify America network all the time, you could literally have no fuel cost for three years. So when does this hit stores? The, I think December. Right, I, it's probably going to be I think Q one. Okay. I don't think we'll see them in December. Is my guess. We're a little close. There's only three in the country, I believe, right so, now. Maybe four, uh, is my understanding. So I'm going to bank on to early this, 21. You know, like I, I follow people on Twitter who track Tesla ships around the right. world. No one's doing that for VWs, and I'm really yep. interested to see the impact of when they start selling these. Because if they sell a hundred thousand of these, there's going to be a lot of people looking over their shoulder and going, "Oh, where did it come from?" And we can just point them to all of the podcasts we've made since we heard about it and gone, "Well, we liked it." Um, I really think that if they can make enough of them and and export them to the US before Chattanooga's up and running, uh, you know, where the all-wheel drive is going to be made and where the cell, the batteries are going to be made as well, I really think that, oh, come on, VW of America. I know it's it's such a behemoth of a company that it's not. You know, it's 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 like a it's a bit of VW that has to fight for itself as well. But I really think the company is is behind EVs, and ah, oh, I really want it to work. Well, I think I'm going to take my 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 sister who drives a first gen Scion XB, like the box, um, to a dealership in January then, and we'll go for a test drive and see what she thinks because you know she's like a, and she drives she, she does ride sharing, so she spends a lot of time in her car and she needs something for that. So, yeah, this, this is perfect for that. Yeah. And it also has rear air vents for the back passengers. So that's a plus. Oh, nice. Oh, and Don, they're so spacious, that, that vehicle, right, Kyle? It, it, when you're sitting in the back, it just, it, it had so much interior volume. I was really, really impressed with it. Well, you guys have me a little bit more excited about this because I hadn't thought about it for my sister, actually, because I mean, we're looking at different things. But yeah, and the Nissan Aria, I kind of, I, you know, I kind of like the Nissan Aria to look at more <laughs> than this, but, you know, that's me. And Kyle, one last thing. I'm surprised you weren't allowed to use any video. They let me use video. No, I know. I pushed drive. them on this. And they said, oh, well, the Germans freaked out about it. So we're just oh. not letting you post anything. So there was yeah. some, I guess, mix up as to what can or should have been posted. But Tom, it's good you got yours up and out of there. So here's the okay. thing, it was weird. They sent me the initial invitation and said no video was allowed, right? Oh. So the day before they sent me a, a reminder, like, you know, tomorrow, uh, my, my drive was in New York City. It wasn't the best area. I was just like fighting traffic for 45 minutes. But um, the, the day before they sent me a thing, and they asked, they said, do you need help with video? So I emailed them back. I'm like, no, I got the video covered. I'm going to be bringing all my own equipment. That's okay, right? And they're like, yeah, that's okay. So I'm like, okay, because the invitation said no video. So I showed up with my stuff, and um, they're like, okay, um, you can't video the exterior of the car at all. But we, we did say that you can 
shoot video, so you're allowed to do video inside. So I'm like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so I think it was like a communications issue. So that's why we got yeah, we were allowed, we were allowed to 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 because I was like I showed up with my cameras and everything. I'm like I have to shoot video inside this car, and they're like, okay, okay, just not the outside. <laughs> Interesting. Look, if you if you do if you do want to drive, you know, uh, with some spirit, can you though? It's rear wheel drive, and it, I want it to be fun. Can you? Is it possible? I drifted it's really it. Really numb. Oh, you could go full sendy send in this thing, and we've seen Tanner Fast now send it around a track. Right. So right. it doesn't encourage you to drive like a hoonigan but if you <laughs> chuck it into a corner it's soft so the weight does transfer the car squishes over that's not a bad thing though you know we always say miata is always the answer that's what it stands for it's the best right. sports car on the market uh this and that is a very soft car setup this is much the same really great balance nice power on the back end so you can really put the pedal in out of corner you can also throw it in and it doesn't actually understeer a lot of cars are set up to understeer like crazy as a safety measure this while it is very neutral you can see off power we just watched it it can get into a corner and move that back around so incredible uh, uh driving dynamics even though it is soft uh that doesn't bother me at all because i'm of the theory that soft isn't bad uh and the steering lock is is insane so if you get it way too sideways not that anyone's going to be drifting their id4s but the meb platform in general you can go like full full lock on the front wheels and uh, what it means in in reality is you have an amazingly tight turning circle uh like i3 tight so i i wow. again i cannot find anything i dislike about this car awesome all right so man we're using up a lot of time um so from the highly anticipated to the highly irregular Kyle also drove the Candy 27 this week, and that's the most affordable car you can buy in the US, I think, today. Candy also offers the Candy 23, which is, I think we have some noise here on the line. Tom, uh, the, yeah. we're good now. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's the most affordable you can buy. It also offers the Candy 23, which is more capable in some respects, but um, less affordable. Uh, so Kyle, tell us about the Candy 27 and why, or indeed, if it's a better value than the 23. So the, the K27 that I drove, uh, first of all, you have to understand where I'm approaching this car. They picked the best person to review this car first because they know I like weird and quirky cars, right? Like, you know, it, someone might come and review this car totally objectively and compare it against a Tesla and it would totally fall. It's not that at all. This is a incredibly inexpensive vehicle when factoring in the tax credit. It is a $7,500 federal tax credit. Of course, we have an additional $4,000 up until the end of the year here in Colorado. So that means I can buy one for under six grand. Now, if you look at the cost of a lithium ion powered easy go golf cart, that is about Thirteen and a half thousand dollars for a mid-range one. So this is half the price of a golf cart uh, when you factor in all of the credits, of course. And it can do 68, 69 miles an hour. I drove it literally on the highways in Dallas next to real trucks and vehicles in America, which was wild. And um, it's so weird. So first off, uh, styling. You asked me specifically K23 versus K27. Uh, can I complain for a second that the higher number one is the worst one, uh, which yeah. doesn't make any sense. So, so the K23 is the one that on paper at least has more range. But uh, as my friend Tommy from TFL Studio says, it looks like it's going to eat your children. Uh, it is so ugly. I don't know who it's would so ever ugly. drive the k 20 three the k27 on the other hand is the exact opposite right. it is pleasant to look at it's happy it gives off good vibes it's cheap and cheerful which is always my my go-to saying for these types of cars and you know what it drove like a normal car it has more range than my electric smart car it can fit four people it can fit more luggage um it's front wheel drive but again it's not powerful enough to really break the tires loose unless you're turning and in that case you can do a little one tire fire uh pulling out of a, a corner and if you watch my first drive on out of spec reviews we actually did that in front of a police officer by accident and he did turn around to come check on us so <laughs> that's all on video of course and then um overall like what's there to dislike here i mean you, you can we nitpick a car that's well, this what's inexpensive the, what's the top speed 68 69 but uh, cruising okay. in metropolitan highway traffic right. 
like in Dallas, I was just, I was passing people everywhere. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't, man, I wouldn't want to take this on like an interstate just because it's just barely almost make, you know, does the maximum speed right, and like everyone where you else live, has to go faster. Yeah. Like we, we've done a 70 mile per hour test with you in Florida and uh, doing that 70 miles an hour, which is the same speed this car would go. We were fine. We didn't die, but cars were certainly passing us and it would be much the same here in Colorado. But if we lived in New York Metro, if we lived in L.A., oh, yeah. especially L.A., if we lived in uh, uh, Miami, you're not seeing 70 miles an hour cruising. You might pop it up there, but then you're slowing back down. You're cruising yeah. at 55, 60 in dense traffic. This is perfect for that. Um, so, so I would say, would it be nice to have an extra 5 or 10 miles an hour? 100%, no question. But uh, is it a deal breaker for a car that's this inexpensive? No, not at all. Um, and what, I, again, range? Uh, so it's rated at 59 EPA, but, but it went, but in your video, you end up, that's like, it gets to that and it's still got 50% left of the battery. And I'm exactly. not sure you, you fully answered that in the video. So, so what, why it's a 17 well, kilowatt hour battery. Yeah. So it, two, two reasons. One, either the gasometer is totally wrong, right? It could just <laughs> be, you know what, if, if we're just putting a big number on there, it's getting reviewed. We don't know for sure. More likely, though, uh, that's not the case. More likely, it is uh, just the fact that for whatever reason, in EPA testing, some cars don't do well. We see this with Taycan. We just put up a video today, 203 mile EPA. It just did 279 or 278 cruising at 70 miles per hour. So it, does this have the Taycan syndrome? Maybe. But I will say on a full charge, when I got into it, it predicted, I think it had 95% and it predicted 96 miles. So that's over 100 miles on a full charge. Uh, now, again, I got that. I said, oh, they must have just reset the thing, put it to the highest number. They want to wow me with their range. So I ignored it. But then the range never dropped that far while I was driving it. And I was not driving it easily, right? You're giving me a $6,000 car and saying, go and have fun. I'm sure to treat it like that. So I'm jumping it over curbs. I'm flooring it around. We're skidding it. We're doing handbrake turns. And the range just never dropped. Are you ready to do handbrake turns? Oh yeah, it'll do great handbrake turns. <laughs> and it's it's foot brake turns actually. So you gotta get the left foot action right. So you kick it down as hard as you can, then quickly release the latch, but you can keep your foot on it and then you can control when you stop the rear wheels from locking. Uh, but yeah, it, it does uh, 14 miles an hour in reverse. We tested that. It right. does uh, everything you would want it to do. Cup holder is the best cup holder of any car I've ever driven. Uh, this is go. true, though. You see where it is right above my left knee, perfectly placed and in front of the air conditioning vent. So my Starbucks stayed nice and cool throughout the day. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and, and, Kyle, is that, is that a touch screen in the, yeah, in the it, center? It that, is a that touch right screen, there. but you don't even think that you can use it because you cannot <laughs> see the screen during the day. Uh, it is so glary that it just looks like it's off, even at full brightness. I, right. I, I might have to build the hood over. Yeah, but you know what? It doesn't even do anything. It has Bluetooth audio streaming as standard. So you set it up in your garage where it's dark, and then you just never look at it again. <laughs> Does it have a tack? It has a tachometer for motor <laughs> RPM. And you know why? It's because they just took a basic shell right. and adapted it. Right. But the tachometer basically... actually matches motor RPM. The red line isn't calibrated because right. at max speed, you're way in the red. It's really funny. But it's... Uh, I, Again, it's it's so funny. It's weird. I love that. It's a great looking car. I believe it's uh, it's modeled after a Daihatsu of some kind. The Daihatsu cast shares the exact same shell, and there's a few right. other models that do as well. Um, right on. Except this is the best one. Right. And available <laughs> in the U.S. So really quickly, so how are they able to sell that here? How are they able to get it? Because, you know, would you... Oh, that's the ugly one. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, bought, I put the wrong one up. <laughs> lower number, worse car. More expensive, lower number, worse car. Yeah. The thing is, uh, on paper, it sounds better, but the car's actually worse because it's like they're kind of trying to make it a nice car uh, for right. the K23. And if you're trying to make it a nice car, it's not. It doesn't have the range. Of course, I'll review yeah. it at some point. But this one's so bad, it's good, if you know what I'm saying. It's like yeah, the yeah. really ugly puppy that you love. So uh, uh, that's where it fits under 10, in. Under, under 10 grand. So, you know, if, if you buy one and then you, you have, you know, remorse, um, you're not out like, a, well, a lot more money if you had, a you know, sprung for a, a Chevy Bolt or something. Yep. Not, anyway. 
So we should move along. Um, Martin, I hear there's a revolution brewing in your country. Uh, what's this? We hear that the, uh, the UK, under a Tory government, no less, will ban new internal combustion car sales beginning in 10 short years. Yes. Or is it closer uh, to nine in, in 2030? Yeah, totally. And um, uh, I got my, uh, my press release from Her Majesty's government this week. And uh, and yeah, totally. It's um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it, an amazing thing, really. But um, it's uh, nine short years away, and yet um, it's a half ban because they are banning cars from twenty thirty, which don't go a significant range on uh, battery power. So we don't know what that okay. significant range is. It's going to be announced in 2021. So furious lobbying going on from those cars makers, the, the OEMs that have really, really put themselves in the uh, in the uh, hybrid camp. Uh, so very, very interesting. Uh, but yeah, part of a 10 point plan. Um, um, some money going into charging infrastructure and uh, and, in, and incentivizing people to get into EVs. Uh, still, uh, it's positive. It's interesting because this is the same week that Germany announced a three billion euro plan to help their EV industry. It's a billion for the industry. Uh, it's a billion for a scrappage scheme. It's a billion for incentives. Uh, and then we're being like, well, we're going to spend 150 million on being the world leader in battery technology. Uh, so there's a, a plucky Britishness about this, which uh, I, I recognise and and call them out on but the point is they've drawn a line in the sand and said 2030 uh uh for cars that don't emit uh any carbon on a, a significant distance what that is we know we just don't know so you said there's some infrastructure money for this is there any incentives for for buyers uh they forgot to mention the plug-in car grant uh and so which again which is interesting because you know in the same week that uh, sort of California just pops up and it's like, oh yeah, another fifteen hundred off the hood uh, nice. here in in CA. And it's like brilliant. Uh, whereas you know this was our our big uh, plan. Uh, I, unless I missed it, nothing on the plug-in car grant. We get three thousand pounds off the price of a car. Okay. Uh, nothing to do with our taxes or anything um, but, like that. And there's money into infrastructure and charging um, and things like that. The uh, my as I said on the pod my podcast this week, I think this is more about perception than reality. So. Uh, initially, I kind of came around in a big circle. Like I thought, oh, I can't believe they've they put the 2030 date on it. But then, oh, but 2035 for cars that can go significant distance on on battery. And I thought, well, they're going to say like 10 miles and and just give those hybrids another five years. And I kind of came around, and I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't okay, matter though. because our news cycle this week was utterly filled with petrol and diesel are banned. And I saw I saw he uh, one headline this week. Uh, I'll. I'll, uh, I'll misquote it, but it was along the lines of uh, the law just changed to ban petrol. And it's like, on the 1st of January, no one's coming around your house and taking your car keys. Like, that's when they'll stop selling full petrol and diesel cars here. But a car's going to last 15 years. At 2045, 2050, come on. Like, we need to do this for the planet and to stop poisoning people. So, um... We're not even the most ambitious. Like Norway haven't got it in law, but Norway have what's called a parliamentary goal where uh, cars and uh, light vehicles, urban buses will be zero emission by 2025. They may hit it, they may not. Uh, we're 2030. Scotland's 2032, but they'll probably come in line with 2030 or maybe even a bit more just because, you know, just to annoy England and our neighbours down here, they'll just go by two, an extra two years. Uh, but look, plenty of countries have, have got those dates. A lot of 2035s around Europe. Um, France and Spain the 2040. But what's it? What's interesting? Like we, we think we're a big country, of course. Uh, Brexit going on our own. Um, we still think we have an empire. So um, it's interesting that we think we're a big deal. Last year, uh, let me just check check uh, the stats on this. So that we've that 1.4 million cars have been sold this year. So at this point, last year, two million. Obviously, this year got COVIDed. Um, so, you know, it's a couple of million cars in the first three quarters of the year. EVs, what have we sold so far? We've sold 330,000 EVs this year. So, you know, we're not a big market, but we're not an insignificant market. So whilst I say Norway's 2025, um, we're a big enough market, a bit like when California does something. Like, you could kind of ignore it, but it's such a big car market, you're like, oh, right. well, we'll just fall in line. So I wonder... If this is a bigger perception thing, what are you like? How was it? Did it make the news where you are in the US, and and do you think it could impact 
policy on a wider on a wider scale. Well, well, there's so much noise here in our media. It's kind of hard to, for anything outside of the you know our local politics to kind of to break through. But you know, I did see it because of, I, I see these kinds of headlines. But yeah, uh, I think one one of the big things about this is that. You know, like you were saying, the you know public perception might be that you know it's a ban. They're just thinking ban. So if you think of ban and you you, you want to buy, a, you need to buy a car, and it's like twenty twenty seven. You know, they're not banned yet, so you could buy a, a internal combustion car. But then you realize, hey, after you know, if I, you want to sell your car, it's going to have like terrible resale value. Like, who wants to buy a car and you know and when or really good resale value? I mean, it yeah. would depend on the car. I actually think it will have, uh, if we see this ban go into effect, I predict uh, you can buy in 2030 the last of your internal combustion engines and they will hold their value so well into the future because so many people don't want to go to electric. I mean, look, we're we're still at what 1% of or 2% of new cars here. People are buying electric. I think it's too soon uh, to go full electric. I think you let the people who want to buy electric buy it we've already seen they'll buy anything on the lot we've sold every ev that we can make at this point so uh you know there might be other incentives to get manufacturers going i'm not a huge fan of these let's just ban it all here and i'll hear from it from the environmentalist that's fine but you know i i personally choose to drive an ev for the performance driving the technology pushing but not so much of uh, and, and i love the byproduct of it being a more environmentally friendly option especially with all the mileage that i do but there are so many people who just don't even care. They just want a gas car to drive around. They've been doing it and they like the noise and they like the experience. So I really hope there's some clause in this ban that says enthusiast vehicles still can be sold for, you know, people buy horses and ride them on, on the weekends, right? I, I don't think we're ever going to see internal combustion go away because there's something that I need on the daily to cure the soul. And that is three pedals and a screaming V8. So, you know, <laughs> there's, uh, again, I know I'm the minority on this show, but. But I'm not a fan of these bands. Do, is that even a consideration that Absolutely. low production internal combustion vehicles could be sold for enthusiast purposes? Our, our friends over at our sister publication, RideApart.com, will be pleased that motorbikes are exempt and so they just weren't mentioned at all. Um, this is, again, it, it's not... I want to be very careful and I don't overly criticise. And I'm, it's not a half effort by any means because it's, it's bold. You know, I do think... Uh, it's ambitious, but also, like, so I'll make two points and, and I'll let you guys chip in with what you think. Firstly, I think governments, this, this story's been leaked for six months now. It was always going to be, hey, next week they're announcing it. Like, these stories, are, it's called placing the story in the media, and they judge reaction, right? And over the weekend, I heard that it was going to be announced this week. I'm like, oh, we've heard this all before, <laughs> and it finally happened, right? So obviously the time was right. Um, Brexit's a mess. It's, they, they needed some, some green points. I think other countries will watch this and I think politicians will work out whether this has been a vote winner or a vote loser. Sorry to be cynical, but I think all of a sudden you could see France and Spain, big markets, which are 2040 at the minute, and they're not even legal. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, the UK is the first of the G7 countries to legally do a 2050 zero emission, a, a net zero um, country. That's it. We put that into law now. So um, will other countries follow? First point. Um, second point, I forget. Uh, I'll come back to it. But um, but that was like the big thing is will like if it, if it's very popular, would other um, countries and, and politicians kind of jump on the bandwagon and be like, yeah, we're going to do 2030 as well because if it, if it wins you votes, sorry to be cynical, um, could it could it kind of spread without even having to? Oh, my second point, right? So and I'll and, then I'll, and I'll shut up. Um, I actually ended up making this um, point to somebody on my podcast this week. This in nine years' time, and it's been proven over and over again. Humans are notoriously bad at judging innovation. We either do it, we either underestimate or overestimate innovation. Like, it's 2020 now, and I, I should have my hoverboard outside, right? Come on, back to the future, where is it? But, on the other hand, nine years ago, we were using the iPhone 3G. Yeah, it was the second iPhone. It had a new thing called the App Store. First iPhone didn't have an app store. Steve Jobs didn't want other people's apps on his phone. We were using the Nokia N8 nine years ago. We were using the BlackBerry Bold. All right. So right. add nine years to today. I don't think we're going to have any worries about technology. Uh, and I don't want to like say we're all just going to be driving our space cars in nine years. But equally, like we're, we're deep into this world. We know 
how quickly things are moving. Like in nine years' time, is it even going to need to be legislated? I don't know. It's a it's a question. What do you think? And, uh, and, I, 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 okay, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. And, and to, to to Martin's point, and nine years ago, there wasn't even a single DC fast charger installed anywhere in the world. You know, so l look at what nine years does. And uh, uh, what I also think that this is important to do um, these um, proclamations now is. Tell the manufacturers, look, we're serious about this. And, and, you know, we know that your life cycles are five years or six years or whatever. So we're not saying you have to, you know, uh, uh, drop all your internal combustion engines now because in five years is, you know, your next life cycle begins. But we're giving you two, we're giving you two advanced life cycles because that's about five years, the gestation period between paper and pavement on, on a car. So he, here you go. You've got two life cycles. Get, get your ship in order because this is coming. And even if it doesn't actually happen at 2030, I think it'll get the, the, the it'll grease the wheels and it'll get things moving in these companies, the laggards, the companies like the Fiat Chryslers that just seem to be, you know, really holding back as much as they can, the Toyotas, uh, you know, um, the Hondas that, that just don't seem to, to really want to make that commitment. So I think the more of these announcements that we get now, the better, even if when the time comes, it's, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a gray area where, you know, they, they walk it back a little bit and say, oh, OK, you can still sell a few more for a few more years or, hey, you know, performance, low production performance vehicles are exempt for Kyle or, or whatever. Um, but I, I think it's a good idea that we're making these statements now. And 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 like you said, uh, Martin, you know, um, the news is going to, you know, ice ban, you know, gas, no more. And that's it, it has to start sinking into people that this is coming. It might not be yeah. 2030. It might not be 2035. But understand throughout the world, this is coming. So the earlier we start softening that blow, the, the easier it'll be. Now, New Jersey, where I live, announced that we're considering a 2035 ban on ice vehicles. So, of course, you know, everybody that knows me, you know, just my friends talking casual groups and even my my uh, my uncle who manages fleets of vehicles was like, well, what am I going to do with all of my trucks that I have now? Like, all of a sudden I can't be on the road. And I'm like, relax. Nobody's going to, yeah. you know, you know, the, the, the you know, big brother isn't going to come and padlock your, your vehicles. You know, this is going to be new vehicles moving forward. And, yeah, there's going to be, you know, uh, they're not going to crash the economy. But understand by then, by 2035, I bet you most of your fleet has plugs to begin with. You know, and right. uh, once you realize how much you're, how much money you're going to save on fuel and maintenance, any of it, that's what I think is really important about this: is sending the message as much as anything. Well, I, I think by 2025, people are going to want to take the electric option anyway if, they, if they're faced with a choice, because you know the, the price should be pretty close to parity. And and performance will be vastly improved from what we see now in uh, just a few short years. So just to underline this point and and to also move on to the next story. So um, if you're a skeptical skeptical about GM, uh, General Motors electrification efforts, maybe this will change your mind. The country's biggest automaker is now doubling down on its efforts and has made a number of announcements ahead of an appearance by uh, CEO Mary Barra and others at the 2020 edition of the Barclays Global Automotive Conference. Uh, GM has increased the money it's investing in its, in its electrification program from $20 billion to $27 billion. Uh, that it had planned pre, uh, prior to the pandemic. That's uh, that's more than it's planning to spend on internal combustion vehicle programs in that same time frame. And this will help them launch 30 all-electric vehicles by the end of 2025, uh, more than two-thirds of which will be available in the U.S. The other ones, I guess, the other big market is China. Uh, GM also talked about the progress that they've made with its EV program. So check this out. For instance, they've, they've increased the maximum range of its Ultium-based EVs from 400 to 450 miles. Uh, they talked about their Ultium batteries, which are now testing the second generation of cells that could be in vehicles by 2025. Uh, those will offer, they say, double the energy density of today's cells. And that's those found in the Bolt EV and, and the Bell, so 60% cheaper. So this is like just, you know, what we we're saying, but 2025, you know, close to price parity and a lot better performance. Cars will, you know, go the same distance, but be lighter and handle better. 
and you know i would imagine probably charge faster but that's important so i didn't do the math on this today but uh, previously i had i had asked the gm executive if they could hit 400 watt hours per kilogram in their uh, in their cells in this time frame and he was very confident and that said sure so this is very encouraging you know they're following up with this these numbers now um, also, they're moving up their Cadillac Lyric production calendar by nine months. Uh, so instead of coming late 2022, the Lyric should be shining in showrooms around the first quarter of, the, of that year, much closer to the GMC Hummer first deliveries. Uh, they moved up some other programs as well, but they didn't say which vehicles. Uh, so oh, speaking of vehicles, if you watched the presentation, it, it was on yesterday. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to... Uh, if they're going to be a rebroadcast of that available. If there is, it might be on the uh, General Motors Investor Relations page. Uh, but yeah, they were on the uh, stage yesterday and they, behind them, behind the three executives, they had three electric vehicles that, that the public hadn't seen before. So there's the, if you're looking on your screen, you can see there's the SUV version of the Hummer EV. As you can see, it looks like the pickup truck, but with a, you know the extra bit over the back. Mm, looks pretty good. Uh, there was also a Equinox size Chevy crossover SUV, you know, directly in the middle in the back. Uh, yeah, if you pull that up, you can see a little bit of it. We can't really see a whole lot of detail. Um, I believe these will have a lot of the uh, styling language that today's uh, Chevy crossovers have. And then on the right hand side, that nose of the vehicle there, that is the Chevy pickup truck. And I think I'm not sure. There's a there's a picture somewhere. If you can just see that one gentleman on the right, uh, it's just him in the picture. Then you can see like the side view of the of the pickup truck. It's more um, Chevy Avalanche than actual like Silverado as far as like the structure of the side of the back, the way the box comes down. It's not quite the traditional uh, pickup truck you might think about. So yeah, so I brought up a quite a number of things here. Tom, what about what about these things stands out most for you? Well, you know that GM is is finally admitting that you know this is the future, and they need to put the whole weight of the brand behind it. You know, Volkswagen did this three years ago, and um, said, you know what, we're it's it's time to pivot, and I'm sure Dieselgate pushed them in that direction. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't entirely because of Dieselgate. I'm sure that they had already been trying to weigh their options. When do we go all in? I think all the manufacturers know they have to go all in at some point. It's just many of them don't believe it's 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 the time is is yet is, is upon us. And obviously, GM now believes it is. And uh, I give them credit. And I think, you know, we talked about uh, some of the legacy brands. Are some of them going to die off in this shift to electrification? And I I've maintained that for many years that some of the big players in today's market are not going to survive this 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 seismic shift of the industry. I don't know who yet, but I think the ones that will survive are the ones that are going to accept earlier that, look, this is the way the industry is going. So we're going to put all our cards on the table and we're going to be ready for this. And uh, I think that's a good move for long term for GM. It's not going to be a good short term move. They're, you know, they're you know, it's not going to, the company is going to be investing, you know, more money than they, than they bring in. It's going to, it's going to really hurt um, dividends and so forth, but um, it's, it's necessary in today's market to survive. And uh, I think that they're going to benefit from this. I think uh, Martin's battery camera battery war ran out <laughs> ironically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kyle, so do you have some thoughts about this uh, big GM announcement? You know, I was just in Detroit uh, this week driving past GM headquarters literally two days ago now, and uh, we were looking around. We're like, can we see anything interesting? And I'm fairly certain we saw the back end of one of these, uh, that that Hummer that was squared off just going right through the building. I was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, do I have a thought on this? Look, I think they're late. Uh, look, you, you've got to find a way, and GM's been the the most conservative when it comes to electrification, I would say, especially when compared to Ford, uh, that 
that years ago, like Tom said, VW did this years ago. BMW is behind. Uh, all the manufacturers are playing catch up. And it's a game as to when do we jump in. And I think you need to at least outwardly jump in. Still make your, your Silverados, make your ICE cars for everyone. It's not like they're even paying attention. They don't even know that you've announced anything. But at least put the weight behind the company. And I think finally we're seeing GM do this. It's years too late in my opinion. Are they going to be able to catch up? I don't know. Are they going to rely on Nikola's technology that probably doesn't exist? I don't know. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens with all of this stuff. Uh, there's there's so much up in the air. Um, I, I do want to bring up a point, though. While GM had this conference yesterday to appeal to invest, investors and things like this, uh, yesterday Ford had the SEMA night show and blew everyone's minds away with these awesome off-roady uh, uh, Broncos and the Mustang Mach-E drifting around the racetrack. And like, it really excited me. I watched the whole thing. Very rarely does that happen. Mm. So on one hand, you have GM just saying, yeah, here's what we're going to do. And I know they have to do these investor calls and everything's like that. But Ford just killed it last night, especially highlighting the Mustang Mach-E right up front with everything uh, as one of their highlight vehicles in the lineup. So uh, I know we're talking about GM, but I did have to squeeze in that oh, Ford is just blowing it away. And I'm driving the Mach-E on Tuesday. That's, that's where that you say that. I, I, I see uh, GM as very much ahead of Ford in electrification. Ford's got a great thing going on with the Mach-E, and I, I really like that they focus on a product. You know, and um, GM's efforts are a bit more spread across, you know, entire lineup. So, and that allows them allows for scale and lowering costs and they have their own battery, you know, they're building their own batteries together with LG. And that's something that I believe Ford has now decided they're going to probably have to do as well. Uh, so right. I, well, I we've already that. heard uh, the Mustang will be shared uh, platform with another vehicle. We're that's not true. sure what it'll be. We know of the E, Lincoln. not the E Crafter. That's the Volkswagen thing. They're a little transit electric. And uh, so, yeah, maybe GM's approach of making uh, modular components across the entire lineup is the best approach. I, I don't disagree with that. That's we've seen it from Tesla. That's what they do. The Model Three and Y share the same thing. S and X yeah, all share the same components. Yeah, and Volkswagen with the MEB, everything's going to be the same. Right. Um, Ford will probably have to transition, but I'm just saying from an outward consumer facing uh, projection, Ford is just no one's touching them right now in terms of promoting their electric vehicle from a it's legacy true. OEM. Good excitement generation for sure. I, I, I believe yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really the the laggards in my mind are like. Uh, FCA, like Fiat, Chrysler. and Yeah, uh, they're just putting Hellcat engines in everything. They did the Durango Hellcat launch this geez. week in North Carolina. Like, yeah. first of all, hilarious. But secondly, come on. Yeah, it's a little, uh, yeah. And then there's a Nissan, which was, man, with one vehicle. I mean, I like it. It's okay. And I, but man, it's not ambitious enough. You know, they really, I think they've really missed their chance, you know, when they, uh, with with Renault together, they should have had the Leaf the Zoe things that should have been on the same vehicle on the same platform scale gives you scale gives you interchangeability of parts. Um, it's, it's just a lost opportunity for them. But uh, just real quick because we're kind of low on time, um, so I want to talk about an, another similar kind of investment that we just heard about from GM. They weren't the only one talking up their electrifications efforts this week. Volkswagen, which has a similar sort of strategy we were just mentioning, they engineer a common platform for a large number of electric vehicles and then use scale to make them affordable for customers. It approved a five-year plan to spend a staggering $41 billion on its electrification efforts. That's sort of an overall budget of $86 billion. And it doesn't include like hybrids or e-mobility or other things. So that's that's almost serious money. Like and that's a lot more than GM is is you know spending over that same time period, which is you know I, it's that's a lot of money. So it now says twenty percent of its car sales will be electric by twenty twenty five, and it will offer seventy five electric models by twenty twenty nine. In this decade, VW expects to produce about twenty six million electric vehicles, nineteen million of which will be on the MEB platform. So yeah, that just underlines, you know, the by the time the UK bans uh, combustion engine new car sales, there's going to be a lot of electric Volkswagens on the road and available for sale in showrooms. 
Martin, does this take the stink out of yeah. Dieselgate for you a little bit? Yeah, it does. It does. And I think they're doing the right thing. And I think that the leadership is is vocal. And, you know, we don't you don't companies don't need leaders to be Twitter stars. But I think Herbert Deese has been selective with with what he's done. And of course, that kind of connection with Elon has raised his profile in the EV community, but also has just uh, made a, a set of big, bold, scary short term decisions. Um, but VW are uh, lucky that they have a reasonable investment structure in terms of uh, having some 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 investors who can wait this out for the long term. You know, they're not waiting on the you know the quarterly results and they want their dividends. So you've got some big institutional investors and and even you know bits of the country uh, own bits of the company. So uh, I think they've used that to their advantage. It's going to be a tough decade for VW to do this, and it's um it's something like. A third of the money that they're going to spend, or something, or some some crazy number like a quarter or a third of 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 their total spend is going to be on 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 developing. It's, it's these, almost half. Uh, amazing news, and, um, and almost just the, 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 yeah. Is it half of of their budget? So, like, it's crazy. It's like half their budget. Is they're going to? Um, and this is a, 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 a an enormous company built around how to build combustion you know how to build combustion engines and how to source parts just in time and assemble them and in five years maybe the last five years like uh, uh, their whole company has been to i can't think of many other businesses that operate in this level of disruption apart from perhaps you know silicon valley and startups and software but yeah you can get a software company that dominates the world and has 12 employees so you know, and a bunch of venture capitalists behind it. And so this is deeply impressive from VW. Um, and again, I'm not sure I have it on my desk. I do, I do. This is, um, I wanted to fully understand the ID3. So I was like, oh, you know what, what I do is I go to the VW website and I'll print out the, like, the PDF. Like, I hope they have a PDF, and they do. And then this is the VW ID3 price and specification guide as of the 4th of November. And it's all about the first edition the set one two three four five six the eight different versions what you get uh, the factory options the factory list more lists more battery sizes more the business the family the style hell I've lost the will to live already uh, the tech the max the tour the the the, the bit ah oh god the interior pack that does come with the family but not the max <laughs> companies have got to get they've got to get out of their own way seriously yeah um you know what build the order phone, online I, I, on my phone I choose screen size and color boom order bring it to me now and it's like i know that these companies have operated this way forever and they probably don't want to give up their options list soon but that's that was the when i i, I sat it's like 28 pages of op and i'm like no no this is not i just hope porsche isn't listening right now because that is the one thing i love about porsche everyone's almost different right okay. but for these mass cars yes color battery go yeah, yeah, and all of it's explained. Drive. All of it is all of it is just in the typical um, manufacturer options list, where it's in a grid format, and it's like, and then a little dot in the column. Oh, for that I hate and not, that. And I'm like, but what is you know? Let, let's. But uh, so it just is says, that for the UK. Yeah, so it just says yeah. uh, heat pump. Do you want to specify it? Not what the <laughs> hell is a heat pump? So obviously, it's yeah. twelve hundred and fifty pounds. No, I don't want one of those. Thanks very much. We cannot much. get that in the US. But actually, you pump. really, really do want a heat pump. And, and actually, yeah. it should be bloody standard. So don't get me started. Yeah. But right. oh my God, there's pages of wheels. And um, these companies have got to get, get out of their own way. This, it's, a, it's a bugbear of mine. Right on. <laughs> okay. So, like, where, where I'm just going to send Martin complicated vehicle specifications on a <laughs> don't you basis dare. now. <laughs> So we're way over our time, and so I want to hit a couple of things really quick. Then uh, Tom once mentioned something too, I think. So uh, Toyota, we keep slamming them for not having any electric vehicles, but they introduced the Pro Ace Verso electric passenger van to Europe, Martin, uh, this week. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, the Chevy not Bolt made by, EV, not made by Toyota, not made by Toyota, not made by Toyota. Oh, really? Who makes it? Oh, is it PSA make that one for them? It's not a Toyota. Oh, it's their oh, it's, it's a rebadge of something. Uh, 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 okay. I think yeah, it's it's uh it's a PSA company, uh PSA vehicle. Um the Verso is not. 
Because uh, I was like, wow, Toyota have made a plug-in car. Oh, okay. the small print. No, they haven't at all. Okay, I'll curb my enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, the Chevy Bolt EV has been recalled in the face of fires. Uh, so, uh, if you ha- so schedule if you have a Bolt EV, schedule an appointment with your dealer or service station and um, don't fill up past 90% until you do, and they're going to change some software things so that it leaves a 10% buffer. So because these fires have happened when cars have been completely full or almost full, um, they wouldn't say whether or not with as when they were charging. Um, and then sometime in the new year, they'll figure out exactly what's going on and make their final decision. Well, maybe they'll be replacing batteries or maybe there'll be some, you know, software changes. So you might end up with a bit less range, but then again, you might also get a check because that would probably involve a, like a huge lawsuit. So uh, interesting times for our Bolt EV owners, but uh, it's you know still a great car and the 2020s are not affected by this. And a lot of the 2019s aren't affected by this. So make sure, you know, if you, know, you can go to the NHTSA site, NHTSA site and see if your car is affected. Um, also, so to, just to close this out, Electrify America has launched its plug and charge payment technology. Tom, do you want to give us a minute on that? Okay, I can do it less than a minute. So the okay. <laughs> Electrify America officially rolled out their plug and charge capabilities. That's a global standard, uh, ISO 15118. Um, it has encrypted security measures for safety, but basically, you pull up to the charging station, you get out, you plug your car in and you walk away. And the car communicates with the station and charges you for that session. Uh, exactly what Tesla has been doing all along on their supercharger network. It's a lot harder for other companies to do it because they have to deal with equipment from different vendors. They have to deal with dozens and dozens of vehicles from many different manufacturers. So it, it, it wasn't as easy as Tesla because they're so vertically integrated. It's their car, it's their equipment. They can do it rather simply, uh, much harder for everybody else. But this is uh, Electrify America announced. They're, they've rolled it out now. All of their stations are capable of it. The problem is there are no cars that are capable of it yet, but there will be soon. As you can see in that picture there, the first three cars that are gonna be plug and charge uh, capable are the Porsche Taycan, the Mustang Mach-E and the Lucid Air. They should be within the next few months, these vehicles should be able to uh, plug in, to use the plug and charge technology. Yay, that's all I have to say about that. That's like awesome news because charging should be that easy. You know, just pull up, plug it in and you know, payment is all taken, it should be easier than gas. And because usually it is because you, you're in your, your garage or your driveway and you just, you know, plug it in and walk away and it's done. But anyway, that brings well, us to one the- last thing, Dom. Oh. It's important to note a lot of people complain about Electrify America stations, that they're they're having difficulty initiating a charging session or they get kicked off. A lot of the problems that Electrify America has had has been with like initializing the session credit card readers, the app communicating with the station. So like this should eliminate a lot of the problems that we've seen with the Electrify America network. So fingers crossed. Also great news for sure. All right. So that brings us to the end of our show for real. Uh, Thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comment section, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Martin is at EV News Daily. Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Uh, Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao. Mm -hmm.